My name is Spencer. My business is called Toddlers Can Read, but really I support anyone who wants to teach their kid how to read. So if you're sitting here and you've got a kid who's older, I got you covered. We'll talk about how to make this fun and engaging for them too. If your kid is younger, I've got you covered too. We'll talk about the signs of readiness for them as well. So no matter where you're at, I'm going to make sure that you're walking away with something fun, something engaging, something practical that you can actually put in place with your kid. Okay. So very, very quick intro for me. I'll hit a couple points that Alex didn't mention. Prior to this, I taught kindergarten and first grade. So my primary teaching experience is with kids aged five to seven. But at that level, you really see kids all over. You see kids who are coming in who are way behind, kids who are way ahead, but I just love working with little kids. Now, I thought I was going to be a teacher my whole life, but when my wife got pregnant with our son, I realized I wasn't going to be able to be the kind of teacher I wanted to be and the kind of dad I wanted to be. So I left teaching and I became a dad. At that point, the job I transitioned to was a coaching role for educators. So I spent a number of years teaching teachers how to teach reading better. And over that time, I learned a lot about how reading works and how the brain works and all that good stuff. But ultimately, it wasn't what I was passionate about. What I'm passionate about isn't working with teachers, it's working with kids and it's working with families, which is why I'm really excited for this event today. So I transitioned out of that role, kind of coaching and developing teachers to found and start Toddlers Can Read, where I now work directly with parents and with kids, which to me is really, really special. So there's a big problem here, right? So the reason why I, I taught and the reason why I had a job coaching teachers and the reason why I have a job now helping support parents with their kids is there is a problem with reading instruction in America. And this should not come as a surprise. And we, we, we just have to, to set the stage here before we go into how to teach this so y'all understand why this is so important. Reading impacts almost every aspect of our child's development, almost every aspect of their life in school and outside of school. Unfortunately, most kids struggle with reading. And when I say most kids, I mean two thirds of fourth graders are below grade level in reading. And we have all these graphs. I put two of them in. I could have pulled thousands of graphs that show kids struggle with reading, but I don't think we actually need to look at the graphs. I don't think we need to look at the numbers. I think we can think about our own experience in school. And for many of us, Two thirds of us, myself included, we can remember struggling to learn how to read. We remember it was tough. We remember waiting, counting the paragraphs ahead before we got called on in school, trying to memorize what we had to read before the teacher got to us because we weren't confident. We remember reading stuff and not remembering any of it because we spent all of our energy figuring out what those words said instead of what those words meant. And unfortunately, not just do kids struggle with reading, but the gap gets bigger with time. Got a lot of folks online saying, just wait, they'll catch up. You know, it's not true. Sure, some kids catch up, but for most kids, the gap grows larger with time, not smaller. So there is a big fundamental problem with how we teach reading. Now, the good news is, because I don't want to leave you with just the problem, the good news is we know how to teach reading. I'll show you in just a moment. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll break out the whiteboard. I'll show you how to teach it. We know how to teach reading. We know what works and we have decades of research to support this. Not just do we know how to teach it, it's a lot simpler than many folks think. It's not that complicated. It can be a lot more fun than most people think. You can start a lot earlier than most people think and you don't need any teaching experience. The best, most effective way to teach a kid to read is to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. That is what schools struggle to do because there's so many kids in the classroom. And that's what you can do as the parent, the caregiver, the loved one, the big brother, the big sister. You can work with the kid one-on-one -on -one to move them quickly, to help them have fun and help the kid learn how to read. So this really truly is good news for anyone who's worried about your kids reading now or in the future. If you get your kid caught up, or you help your kid get ahead, you build these early milestones, you're truly not gonna have to worry about these effects down the line because your kid is gonna transition from learning to read to reading to learn. And once they make that switch, that's where the magic happens. So 
a lot of folks wonder, when can you start teaching a kid to read? I get that it's important, but when can you actually start? So if you're sitting here and you've got a little one, maybe they're three or under, you're really looking for four signs of readiness here. Number one, can they pronounce the sounds? We're thinking about their oral language. So it's gonna be hard for your child to learn that this sound says ah, if they can't physically produce the ah sound. So we're starting by teaching sounds our kids can pronounce and we're looking for signs of oral language readiness first. Then we have to consider our kids' memory. Are they able to remember things from day to day? If I show them a circle, can they remember the next day that is a circle? If they learn this is gray one day, can they remember that is gray the next day? We can look to things like colors, shapes, objects to determine if our kid has the memory to hold. This sound says ah from today to tomorrow. And if they've got the oral language and they've got the memory, they've got a lot of what it takes to learn how to read. The rest of this really depends on you. Do you believe they can focus? Do you believe they can pay attention? As I'll show you in this training, you don't need a kid sitting still, robot-like for an hour to teach them how to read. You just need to get them looking at and engaging in those sounds. And if you believe they can do it, they can. And the last thing is, are you ready? If you're at this training, I'm assuming you're ready to go. I'm assuming you're gonna finish this training, download those flashcards and get to work, but you really gotta look yourself in the mirror and say, do I wanna do this with my kid right now? Am I ready to make three minutes, four minutes, five minutes a day to help my kid with the reading? And if all four of those things are good to go, you're ready to teach. So I'm gonna hop off here for one second. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I just wanna talk through the reading process with you all real quick, because for a lot of us, when we went to school, we were taught how to read the wrong way. We, what we were taught is, is part of the reasons why those graphics I showed you are so bad. Why not just is reading in America generally low, but post pandemic, it's even lower. It's because kids are taught how to memorize words. Kids are taught how to guess words. Kids are taught how to look at the picture and try and figure it out instead of taught how to sound out and decode each one of those words. And I want to show you what this looks like when we teach kids to memorize words versus when we teach them the sounds that are in those words, okay? So let's say I have the word and the word is sit. There's two ways to go about teaching this word. Way number one is I show the whole word to my kid on a flashcard or something like that. I show it to my kid and I say, this word is sit. Now you say it, sit, and we do drill and kill, right? We just try to memorize this word, memorize the word, memorize the word. Eventually, my kid is going to learn this word says sit. Once they've learned that, our kid now knows a grand total of one words. This is all they know. If I took any sound in that word and I changed it, they would not know what that word is. All they know is that one word right there, that word sit. They don't know this. If I change the middle, they still don't know because they've memorized this unit. They've memorized the word sit. They haven't learned a skill. And reading is all about skills. So let's look at strategy number two. Strategy number two says, reading is about learning the sounds and how to combine them together. Learning that this S, it says S. This thing right here, this I, it says I. And this little thing in the end, that T, it says T. S, I, T. Then it's about blending and stretching and combining the sounds to help our kids understand S, I, T makes sit, sit. If we can teach our children the sounds the letters make and how to stretch those sounds together and blend them, they can read almost every word they see. So when we take this first letter and we change it, 
Our kid can still do it. They know it, pit. I can change this letter and they can sound up at, pat. So instead of knowing one word, our kid instantly goes to thousands of words. And the more sounds we teach them and the better their blending become, they go to tens of thousands of words. And we know there are simply too many words in the English language to memorize. So kids who learn to read by memorizing early, it looks good when we give them basic books. It like looks fun on Instagram, but when they get to second, third, fourth grade, we start to see those gaps. And as they get older and older and older, those gaps increase. So I want you all to understand there's two big skills that go into learning to read early. Number one, you've got to know the letter sounds, the sounds the letters make that this thing says ah. Number two, you've got to know how to blend and how to combine those sounds together into words. At, set. At the very beginning, it does not need to be fast. It does not need to be quick. You just need to be practicing it. So we've talked about reading versus memorizing. I would ask y'all to call out, but you can't come off mute. So I'll just assume that you understand we're focused on reading, not memorizing. Then we talked about reading being the process of combining sounds and blending them together. We have sounds and blending. The last thing I want to hit here is where do letter names come in? Because this session is called Making the Alphabet Fun. And when most folks think alphabet, they think ABCs, the names of the letters. And it is important to know the names of the letters. It's just not essential for beginning to read. Knowing the names of letters helps us to identify the letters. It helps us to talk about the letters. When I show you this thing, you need to know the name of it to talk about it. You need to say, oh, Spence, that's a B. The name of that thing is B, okay? When we spell and we're trying to figure out the spellings, we need to be able to talk about the letters. We need to have words to use to describe the letters. Letter names help with talking, they help with identifying, but it is the letter sound it is that this makes B that we need to be able to read. Eventually, your child needs to know both the letter names and the letter sounds, but in this session, I'm gonna focus on those sounds we need to read and just understand right now, every game, every activity that you see for letter sounds, you can do the same one for letter names, the same exact thing. But because reading is about letter sounds, that's what I'm gonna focus on here. A tiny bit of background knowledge for you here. Alphabet knowledge is this combination of letter sounds and letter names. And there's lots and lots of research that says the better your child's alphabet knowledge is, the better their reading is. So when our kids know the names of the letters, they can recognize them. When they know those letters have sounds, they can see each of those sounds. We know down the line that there are gonna be stronger readers. Alphabet knowledge is really, really important. Your kid needs to know the names and the sounds. Like I said, we're gonna focus on games for the sounds and the same exact thing can go for letter names. So. I'm gonna come off of my recording again. I'll make a quick note here. I see there's a bunch of people in, in the session. If y'all have questions at any time, drop them in the chat. I'm gonna do like a 15, 20 minute Q&A at the end. I will try and answer every single thing someone asks. There is, is no question too basic, no question too advanced. As I'm talking right now, just drop questions in the Q&A and I'll come back and I'll answer them. Make sure that you feel supported. But, before we look at activities and games for teaching these sounds, we need to understand how to pronounce these sounds. This is one of the biggest hindrances I've seen to parents feeling confident teaching the kid. We have some parents who English is not your first language and so you're not confident with these sounds. We have many parents, myself included, who when it came time to teach, we were unsure what they said. We didn't remember learning this in school, or maybe we learned this wrong in school. And so it's gonna be really important for you to do your best with pronouncing these sounds before you teach your kid. If you're not pronouncing it perfectly, no one's perfect, it is okay, but I want you to do your best here. And I'm gonna model how to pronounce these sounds for you. But as I do, what I want you to listen for is how quick and how crisp these sounds are. 
Many of us, when we teach our kids the sounds, we try to make this fun, we're putting two sounds together. Instead of b, we're saying b. And b is b, ba. It's two sounds. We're saying k, k, a. It's two sounds instead of one sound. That makes learning how to blend harder because your kid's gonna be hearing a bunch of extra sounds every time they try to read a word. Instead, we're quick, we're crisp, we keep it moving, okay? Now, I've got some videos on social media where I pronounce the sounds and I fly through. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you the letter for a second. And I know that I can't hear you. I know that you can't come off mute. But what I want you to do is I want you to say the sound with me. I want you to say the sound first. I really want you to practice this because you're going to leave this call and you'll be like, I wish I practiced, okay? So I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to hold it up for a second. And I want your voice to come on and say the sound before my voice does. So you say it. And then when you hear me, that will be your check for did you get it? Did you not get it? Cool. Okay. This sound. Say this one. Put a little bit closer for y'all. Yeah. That one's hard. Really quick. Keep trying it right before my voice. Yeah. Ch. Ooh. This one's hard for kids to pronounce. Mmm. Mmm. Ah. Ooh. Ooh. This one is not er. These last couple, try it before I say it. Like the beginning of water. I'll do that one again. Like the beginning of yellow. If you watch that and you're like, that is not at all how I say them, it is okay, okay? Practice, practice cutting that off, off the end and your pronunciation doesn't need to be perfect, but I want you to keep that in mind and I want you to try. Try your best as you go because it is gonna make your little one's learning process and the blending process smoother if they can say the sounds crisply. Now, here's the good part, okay? If we've got... The basics, learning to read is about knowing the letter sounds. It's about blending them together into words. We feel comfortable with the fact that we're not going to teach our kid to memorize a bunch of words, but we're going to teach them how to, how to sound words out. And we're going to try and be really precise with how we say those sounds. It's time to learn how to teach the sounds, how to teach the sounds. And the biggest difference that I'm gonna make between what you might see from other programs, other people, or how you learned and how we're gonna approach this today is we're not gonna teach every sound at a time. We are not. We are not gonna do A through Z and try and go through every single thing because this is too much for your kid to learn at a time. This is overwhelming. This is frustrating. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pick two to four sounds to practice at a time. That is it. For some kids, 
they are what I call two sound kits. At the very beginning, if we show our kids two sounds like this, they are set. This is enough for them to learn. They can focus on these two sounds all week and by the end of the week, hopefully they learn them. Some kids were three sound kits. We can practice three at a time and we can learn about three sounds in a week. Some kids are four sound kits. They can learn about four sounds in a week. Every kid is different. I had a three sound kit. We practice three sounds at a time and that's what worked best for him. But for you, the first thing you've got to decide is how many sounds you're going to practice. I recommend two to four. You can start with just three letter sounds. And if, it, if it's hard and they're struggling, you can move down to two. And if it's easy, they've got it, you can move it to four. But the first thing we do is we pick just a couple letter sounds at a time. And that's what we teach. From there, our job is to get our kid focused on the sounds, paying attention to them, saying them over and over and over again. This sounds intuitive, but you'd be surprised how many people teach and they have a big stack of letters. They show every letter one time. What's this? What's this? What's this? What's this? And then they're done. Every letter gets the same amount of attention. What I'm telling you is when you pick two or three letters, these get almost all of your attention. You're going to focus on these over and over and over again. You want to show these so often that your kid is having dreams about these sounds. They are thinking about these sounds. They are stuck in their head. That's how kids learn. It's repetition. So how do you get your kid focused on the sounds? Well, it's pretty easy. You think of something they like doing and you work the letter sounds into that. For example, if your kid likes to jump, they like to hop, there's a stage in, in kids' development where most kids, they start to learn how to jump and they wanna do it over and over and over again. You can put two sounds on the ground and tell your kid, okay, we're gonna play a game. Today, I want you to hop on the sound that says D and watch them jump. Now hop on the sound that says G and watch them jump. We take the kid's interest, we build it into a game. And they don't jump once or twice, they jump a bunch. They jump, they jump, they jump, they jump. After jumping, we have them say the sound. They're jumping on the D and they're saying D. They're jumping on the G and they're saying G. We get them looking, right? If your kid likes running, I've set this up in my house behind me. You can take a flashcard two, three, and you can tape them around the house. Tape them at a distance. You can go outside and put these in different areas and you tell your kid, okay, today we're practicing these three sounds. I want you to run as fast as you can to the sound that says, eh. And your kid's gonna look, they're gonna think this is the learning. Doesn't look like it, but this is the learning. They're thinking, they're spotting, they see it, they're running over. When they get over, they say the sound, eh. If your kid likes throwing, have them throw the sound. If they like dancing, have them dance to the sound. If they like the floor is lava, you put these sounds on the floor and they can go over that lava, but they're saying the sound as they go. The other day on my Instagram page, I shared a family, it was genius. They put on like thriller music, like a horror movie. They turned off all the lights. They taped the sounds in different places in the room and they gave the kid a flashlight. And the kid had to go like into the dark and they had to identify the sounds with the flashlight, recover the sound, bring it back, put it on the wall, get another one. I've seen people do search and rescue where they take a sound and they hide it. They hide it in a container. You can hide it in magnetiles. You can put it in a cabinet and you make up some story that the sound needs help, it needs to be saved. And then the kid is going on a rescue mission to test to save that sound they're running they're finding it you just make sure that your kid is looking at the sound they're saying the sound and before you know it likely before the end of the week your kid has learned two or three or four new sounds because they've been focused on them so so much so this part there's a little bit of ownership for you to think about what does my kid like what do they enjoy for parents of younger children, you're gonna to have to think through what are they developmentally ready to do? What will their motor skills allow? They might not be able to jump, but can they hit them? 
Can they throw them, right? Can they pull them? What can my kid do to get them looking at and engaged with these sounds? So we show just two to four at a time. I'll pull back up my notes uh, for the folks who are visual here. Two to four sounds at a time, depending on your kid, you can always adjust up or down. We play games and activities with them to help them learn those sounds and see them. In the picture here, this is a parent who put the letters inside just a long box. Nothing fancy, but she knew that her daughter liked pulling stuff out of the box. So she put these little foam letters in and her daughter pulls them out. And every time she pulls it out, she says the sound, puts it down, grabs another one. You can see here, she's having a blast. This is not the traditional sit down, say every sound, every letter of the alphabet, sing the song kind of thing. This is more effective. It is faster and it's more engaging. If you can be creative about the activities you do, your kid is going to love this, okay? We practice these sounds until they're mastered. So this is not, we practice a little bit. This is, we practice until we show up the next day, we show this to our kid and our kid gets it right away. We show it, they say, Zzz. that means the sound's mastered. Once the kid knows the sound, we pick new sounds to teach. So we get rid of those two to four, we pick two to four new ones. And every day at the very beginning of your lesson, this is important, you quickly review the ones they know, and then you play games with the ones they don't know. If my kid knows these sounds, about seven sounds here, if they know these sounds at the beginning of the lesson, I'm gonna show them really quickly just to make sure they don't forget. Zzz, yeah, right, real quick. Okay, we've got it, we've got those in our head, we've learned these, we've reviewed them real quick, we've done a little quick practice. Now, let's pull our two to four sounds. Now let's have some fun, now let's play. And the rest of your lesson is just play, okay? So we do a little bit of review, then we focus the rest of the time on play. I think I saw a question pop up about picking sounds and just say, oh no, just every question you ask, I got you covered. So just keep dropping those questions in. There is a strategy to picking the sounds. It is not a perfect formula. There is no right and wrong, but there's a couple things you wanna consider. So when you're looking, at that stack of 26 letters, you're not picking randomly, but you're picking with a little bit of strategy, okay? And if y'all get your phones ready on this next slide, I'm gonna show you a sequence so you can take a picture of it or you, you can take a, a screenshot, but just get ready. If you wanna capture that, I'm about to show you a sequence there, but I, I wanna explain why I have this sequence, right? So we wanna think about letters our kids can pronounce. If your kid can't make this g sound, you don't need to start with it. You could start with a different sound, right? You don't need to go in A, B, C order just because that's the order of the alphabet. You want to think about what sounds are easiest for your kid. What sounds can they pronounce? What sounds are in their names they're familiar with? What letters do they just like? They just like the S. Most kids just like the S. Can't tell you why. They love that letter, right? It's going to be easier to start with it. The other two factors that I consider is there are letters where the sound of the letter is in that letter's name. For example, this T, when you say the name T, the first sound you make is T. This is T, -E, T, the T sound is in it. So this is an easier sound to teach, especially if you're teaching names too, because the name is already in the sound. Some sounds, on the other hand, that sound is not in the name. So this letter, the name is G. When you say G, you say J, you don't say G. So for a kid to learn that G says G is a harder skill than for them to learn that T says T. So we wanna think about what letters have the sound in them. And the last consideration here as you get started is you wanna think about sounds that are commonly used in words. So if I were to teach my kid the Q, that Q says Q, and that's the very first letter they teach, well, they're not gonna be able to read very much with that letter. They're not gonna be able to do very much, right? But if I teach them A, and that the A says ah, that's gonna be used in a lot of different words. So we wanna teach sounds that help our kids to read as well. 
I'll hold this screen for a second so you can take a screenshot or look at it. This is the letter sound order that I have in my course. What I've done here is I've started with sounds that are easier for kids to pronounce. I've started with sounds that occur frequently in words. I've started with the sounds that I think are generally easiest. And I've finished with the sounds that are a little bit harder. You'll see some of these sounds at the end are the ones when I was practicing pronouncing the sounds with you. I said two or three times, I'm like, hey, this one's a little bit tricky. Listen carefully. Here's how you say it. We want to work our kids through a really easy order. It does not have to be this one. You just have to think about what's easiest for your kid to learn and build those sounds into your games and into your activities. If you were to follow this order, maybe this week you teach s, a, and t. If they've mastered that by the end of the end of this week, maybe next week you teach m, a, right? If they've mastered that, then week three, maybe you review s, a, t, m, a, p, and then you practice b, i, n, right? We start with the sounds that are easiest, we teach just a couple at a time, and then we review the ones they've learned and spend all of our time on that sweet spot, the two to four sounds that your kid is learning. Lots of info here. So here's what I'm gonna do. I see some questions coming in. I wanna talk to you really quickly about what comes after sounds, and then I wanna get to all the letter and all the sound questions that you have. So just so y'all have a sense of where we're going, because you might say, okay, okay, great, but if we teach our kid the sounds, when are they actually going to be able to read? Let me get a marker that works. And I'll stop sharing for a second. The answer is once they know the sounds, you can write down words and you can practice the blending. So we want to learn the sounds. We want to learn blending. We want to help our kids start to stretch it together. At makes at, at. Even if our kid doesn't know the sounds, we can still practice blending. You can do this out loud with nothing written down. You can put away the whiteboard, put away the marker, put away the flashcards, sit down with your kid. You spent a little bit of time today practicing sounds. Now let's spend a little bit practicing blending and you can do the same activity. You can say, okay, listen, daddy's gonna say two sounds. Listen carefully, I'm going to try putting them together. At, at, at. That's gonna help our kid start to learn how to blend. So we do all of the work I've just shown you, playing games with the sounds, making it fun, helping our kid enjoy it. And at some point in the day, we do a little bit of blending. If they know the letter sounds cold, they can look at this and say t right away. You write those sounds down and you blend on your whiteboard. If they don't know the sounds yet, they're still at the beginning, you say those sounds out loud and you have them practice blending out loud, okay? You can blend whether they know the sounds or not. The big key here is you just wanna start small. So many people do this, you know, the first words like cat, mom, dog, dad. Those are three sound words. If we look at this pyramid, that's part way down. We want to start at the top. We want to start with one sound. Can you identify one sound? Can you say one sound? Once they've got that, we go to two. We go to words like at and it and is and on and up. Can we put two sounds together? Once they've got that, we move to three, then move to four. Doesn't matter if they know all their letter sounds yet or not. You just want to carve out a little bit of time here for blending words. I don't want you to leave just with the alphabet. I want you to understand after the alphabet, as they learn the sounds, the letter names, all that good stuff, we want to combine a little bit of blending too. So next steps here. What I want you to walk away with is you need to start by assessing your child's alphabet knowledge. You need to figure out where they're at now. What sounds do they know? What letter names do they know? And what do you need to teach? If your kids got this mastered, you're in a great spot. If they don't, figure out what letters come next, what sounds come next, and teach those, right? You got to figure out where your kid is at now. Then you're going to pick two to four letters at a time, and that's what you teach. Again, adjust. This is not 
a curriculum that we've written that says this has to be on Monday, this has to be on Tuesday, this has, adjust it for your kid. Say, you know what, four was too many, let's dial it back to three. Three was too many, let's dial it back to two. But pick a couple sounds and start playing games with them. Teach them, get them involved, get them active. This picture I've got here, this is one of my favorites. This was a mom in her workout room. She put the sounds down and she had her daughter dance to each one. Not only is she moving, but she's dancing. She's picking them up, she's smiling, she brings them back to mom. That's not an expensive activity. It's not a fancy activity. But this little girl right now, she knows every single one of her letter sounds. She is not in kindergarten yet. She had fun doing it. And if you can build in the fun and excitement for your kid with those two to four sounds playing games, they're going to be golden. When you're ready, spend a little bit of time every day blending words. And we've got some resources here for you all to take as well. So I said I've got something if you say until the end. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions and answers. So I put free links here. First off, Read by Fourth has a ton of resources on their page. This is truly an organization that's doing amazing things for families. So if you're here, you've seen the page, go download some of this stuff, like how kids learn to read. If you watch that video alone, you are putting yourself ahead on your journey towards teaching your kid how to read. So readbyfourth.org slash resources. You can also go to my site. It's Toddlers Read. It's not Toddlers Can Read. It's toddlersread.com slash resource slash fourth. In a moment, I'll put these in the chat too so that you can just click on it. But if you go to that link, you'll see um, just like a little, a little form to get our free flashcards. And if you have any questions for me after the session, just as, as a thank you for attending, for being here, for taking the time, I'm giving you um, our email address here. You can shoot us an email and we will answer that email. If it's something my team can do, they'll do. If I've got to jump in, you've got a really specific question about your kid, I will jump in myself. I'll answer it for you there. So just shoot us an email and we'll be happy to support you from there. So I will drop these in the chat. I will say, thank you. I tried to move quickly, but now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and take a peek at these questions. And Alex, you can let me know. I can either just read through and, and go one by one, or if, if you want to order them, I'm happy to go in any specific order. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, uh, if you would like to maybe just start at the top, uh, we've got some questions both in the chat uh, and in the little Q and A box as well. Um, cool. it's like the uh, we had an earlier one. Uh, is there any order when learning about sounds? Please, uh, alphabet order or not? I think you answered that a uh, bit earlier. Um, no. Then the next one from Lashawn Smith. Uh, I try to use the alphabet song, but replace the letter name with the sounds. Is this a good thing to do or is this memorizing again? It is memorizing again. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say that it's a bad thing to do, but what's going to happen is your kid is going to learn that song. They're not necessarily going to learn what those things represent. So Gracie's Corner has like an awesome phonic song. It's like A says, ah, 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 right? It's not actually that good, but like, it's really catchy. There's millions of kids who've memorized that Gracie's Corner song who do not know their letter sounds. So I'm not going to say that it's bad. It's, it's just different than teaching. And to be honest with you, it's the same reason why I can sing like parts of a BTS song, but I don't speak Korean, right? Like I've, I, I've heard something enough that I can say it back to you, but I haven't actually comprehended. So not good, not bad. If your kid likes it and they have fun doing it, do it, play it for fun. But when it comes time to learning, we've got to sit down and we've, we've got to show the sound, explain what that sound says, and then get our kid looking at and involved with that sound. Another question, uh, should we start with uppercase or lowercase? It's a wonderful question. I prefer to show both cases at the same time. So if this is the letter H, H says, ah. I put both cases on my flashcards because kids can learn both. In learning science, this term is called chunking. It's the reason why phone numbers are broken up into groups of three 
and four, instead of having all digits next to each other, it's because we can remember things easier in chunks. So for most kids, I will not say all, for most kids, you can show them both at the same time. And if you've waited until they've truly mastered it, and then every day you're reviewing those mastered sounds quickly, your kid will know both. And they will not get confused when it comes time to read because, you know, we might think they need to see this version in order to read that. That's not true. They can learn both at the same time. I have seen some kids, maybe one out of 10, maybe a little bit less, who when they see both, they only learn one. And if that's the case, at that point, you can show your kid one case at a time. The more important case for reading is lowercase. It's much more common. The more important case for writing early is uppercase because the strokes are easier to make, more straight lines. So my instinct would be both at the same time. If you have to choose one, my focus is always reading. I would choose just the lowercase and I would teach the uppercase after. Going to oh, read one from the, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was saying thank you for putting the links in the uh, chat. Yep. Uh, we have another uh, question from the Q and A. How do we empower families uh, who are not at an adequate liter literacy rate themselves? It's a wonderful question. I think we need to get rid of this idea that like parents need to have certain education levels or certain experiences in school to be good teachers because they don't. You've got teachers with degrees coming off the diploma who are not effective teachers. And you've got parents with no teaching experience who haven't graduated middle school who are incredible teachers for their kids. A lot of this comes down to knowing the basic steps. What I showed y'all wasn't complicated, right? So take, take that person, take that family that you're thinking about, okay? We say, maybe, maybe it's you. Maybe it's someone you know, maybe someone that you work with. But we say, okay, this parent, they don't have the right literacy rate themselves. They're going to struggle. They can probably understand what I just shared. They can probably get that. They can probably get two or three sounds at a time, play games, review the sounds they've learned, but just focus on a couple at a time. They can get this. And the earlier you start, the easier this is and the less the parent's literacy matters. Because when you get a kid, you know, pre-K, kinder first, if you can get them where they're supposed to be, if you can get them on grade level in first grade or in second grade, if your reading level is above a second grade level and you can get them there, school can do the rest. Typically kids stay on level, they stay ahead if they start there. But the key is just these very basic steps, which they 100% can do and helping their kids master it early so we don't have to worry about it down the line. And I'd say for the folks on here who are educators or who work with families, we've got to simplify our language. Like, I've got a bunch of books over there on reading, very technical books. I know a lot of very technical things about reading. Nobody cares, right? Like nobody cares how much you know if you can't explain it. So we've got to take all this stuff that's in our head. And if the parent feels like they're not confident, they can't do it, they're bad readers themselves. I feel like a bad reader myself based on struggling in school. We've got to say, okay, that doesn't matter. They can do this. And I can coach them through. I can explain this is really, really simple. Here's what you do. And we empower and we encourage that parent with simple language and the true understanding that their literacy rate does not matter. They can teach their kid. Another question from the Q&A. Um, how long should we stay on the letters before moving to another set? You want to stay on the letter until it's mastered, in, until they know it. And what we're looking for for mastered is, can they get the sound? Back to that ABC question, the, the alphabet song, we're going to shuffle these sounds up. We're going to get them out of order instead of simply showing our kid in the same order every time. And if this is a new day, let's say I worked with my son today and I start the lesson tomorrow. We haven't looked at sounds yet at all. And I show this to him and he goes, S, B, F, A, J, right away, quickly, randomly. He's got it mastered. So the day a sound is mastered is the day I stop practicing it 
and I move it to review. So let's say that you're teaching these three sounds to your kid. If you start tomorrow and they've mastered this one, this one goes. The day it's mastered, it goes and it gets replaced with one that they don't know yet. The next day, if this one's mastered, the second you know that thing is mastered, it gets pulled away, you replace it with a new one. So you're always practicing the same number of sounds, but those sounds are changing as they master them. And you want your kid mastering at least two to four sounds in a week. That's a good indicator that we're teaching this well. If it's less than that, that means that either they're not quite ready, your routine is not quite strong enough, or we're showing them too many sounds at a time. Another question from the Q&A, what are the most important or impactful strategies to share in one-time parent interactions? Meaning if you only have one touch point with a parent, what would be the thing that you could communicate to them? I think that's right. I think that was the intent behind the question. Yep. I think this depends on if it is a, you know, it's a single touch point, never see you again, or this is like a kid that's in your class that you have like a meet the teacher and that's your touch point, but you're going to have, you know, some kind of back and forth with them. I'll say in my case, when I approach something like meet the teacher or like a parent event or my kid, this is my only guarantee to get in front of these parents, talk face to face or to communicate something. My number one goal is for the parent to understand that I will do everything possible to help their kid win. I want them to walk away and say, that guy cares about my kid. They care about my kid. They are going to make my kid a priority. They're on my team. That's the biggest thing. Some folks think they have one interaction with the parent. And that's really because that first interaction is super technical. We're using a bunch of words the parent doesn't understand. We're talking about all the things that we need from them. We're not building the connection. But if we start from the place of, let me make sure this parent understands I'm on their team. I'm going to do everything possible to help this kid win. We can buy ourselves additional interactions down the line. I got more parent involvement, more volunteering, more home visits by showing up authentically and saying, I'm just a guy who loves your kid. I'm here for you. I'm, I'm here to help. So that's my number one piece of advice for people who it's one interaction, but you're going to have the kid in your class over the course of the year. Otherwise, if it's just like a, like a presentation like this, you know, it's, it's like we sit down, there's parents of young kids on, on, on this call. This is my only interaction. I want you to walk away thinking that you can do this because for all the people who ask, meet a tutor or want to hire someone else like a tutor is once a week twice a week maybe super expensive not super effective and you are with your kid consistently you are the one with your kid so if you walk away from this i don't want you to think okay like that's really good for him or that's really good for some kids one interaction with the parent you want them to understand they can do this they can do this. They might not have all the knowledge, all the skills, but you want them to understand they can do this and that parent's going to go home and they're going to start to do some research and figure out what they need to do to get it done. We have a couple questions. I think there was one in the chat and one in the Q&A. Um, both kind of are along the lines of, is there a way to adapt these tips for a group, like a library, for example? Um, and what are your tips for only seeing the child weekly let's say if you only see the child weekly try to get the parent on the same page best advice if if if, if you can form a meaningful relationship with the parent not just you're always asking for them but again you're getting on that same team establishing you may see them once but some other adult is seeing them frequently so if you can get the parent on the same page that's where the magic happens if you've got small groups you want to group kids based on which letter sounds they know and which letter sounds they don't know. So this is a perfect science with one kid. With one kid, I know exactly the sounds they know, exactly the sounds they don't. With a group, 
let's say it's, it's five kids or, or seven kids, I can say, okay, this isn't gonna be perfect for every kid, but it's gonna be pretty close. These, these seven kids are all working on these three sounds. Maybe, maybe two of the kids know these, but they don't know these. And you just try and get as close as possible. But the more kids you add, the further and further you get from what each kid needs. And the smaller the group becomes, the closer and closer you get. So I did a lot of my instruction in small groups because I wanted to be closer and closer to the children's needs. But, you know, this is going to require data. This is going to require you taking some time to assess each kid, to figure out where each kid is at before making those groups. Don't just group smart kids and the kids that you don't think are smart, right? It's terrible. It's what a lot of people do. As a member of the lowest group, I remember that. And I do not forgive my teacher for that grouping. You want to group kids based on specific skills. Which sounds do they know? Which sounds do they not know? Okay, let's teach this group these four sounds for the week. What if my child masters the sound but then forgets? Do you bring the letter back into rotation or do you continue with other sounds? Great question. 100% bring it back in. This happens naturally sometimes, but if it's happening often, it means that you're moving the sound to master too quickly. It means they're not getting enough practice with it before it's mastered. Every now and then, like people forget stuff, you know, just, just bring it back in say, oops, looks like we forgot this. We've been getting it wrong. Let's do some more practice, right? But if it happens consistently, it's a problem with, with teaching. If it happens just every now and then, that's a natural part of kids' development. Just give that sound a little bit more practice. That's right. What about the letters that have more than one sound? Should we teach the different sounds at one time or should they be taught separately? Another great question. We teach the primary sound first. The primary sound, some people might refer to this as the hard sound. I'll pull up a letter as an example. Here we go. This letter makes two sounds. It says k and it says s. The primary sound or the hard sound is k. The secondary sound or the soft sound is s. First, we teach the kid this says k. The reason being, the k sound from C is more common. It is what they're going to see in early reader books. They're going to see the word cat before they see the word scent or city or center, right? We start with the primary sound that says k. G, we start with G says k. Then once they've mastered that, they've mastered the other primary sounds, we start to introduce the rules for when it says other sounds. So I'll teach this as k. Then once they've got it, they've got all the letter sounds. Oh, that great. Remember the sound? What does the sound say? That's right. It says k, but guess what? It can say something else too. This can also say s. Let's try reading some words where c says s. Then we'll write down some words. We'll look at the pattern and we'll learn. Oh, c says s right before an e, an i, or a y. So when I see that pattern, I'm going to try it with s. Otherwise, I'm going to try it with k. Another question from the chat. How do you address different dialects? Yeah, this is where with pronunciation, I try not to say you've got to say it this way. More so, try to cut the extra sound. I live in Texas. I used to live in, in Massachusetts. There's a different way that people speak. and that's okay, right? Like the eh, as I say it, it becomes a little more of an eh. You know, there's the, the, the vowels change a little bit. There's, there's folks who, who speak other languages. And so some of the sounds in English don't translate to other languages. So my best advice is like, first off, don't sweat it. Because oftentimes people beat themselves up over not having like, like perfect English accent when there really is no such thing, you know? And as a result, they just never get started. My biggest thing, like different dialect, same dialect, accent, no accent, first language, third language. My biggest advice is take the uh off the end. That is something we can do in any language, any accent, take the uh off. Don't say pa, say p. And if we can focus on that, that's going to be really powerful for our kids. Uh, 
uh, another question from the Q&A box. Um, when reviewing the sounds they know, are we saying them or having our child say the sounds? The kid says them. The kid says them. So if we think about different activities for different purposes, if our kid is learning, let's say three sounds at a time, we might put those three sounds out and let's say it's the jumping game and, and we have our kid just, just jump, 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 jump. They're saying the sound. Mm, 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 mm. They're saying as much possible, jump, jump, jump. Again, again, again. For review, this is super quick because we want to save all the time for those two to four sounds they're learning. We want that to be the majority. So review, just show it to them. Super quick, have them say it. That's right. Ah, that's right, really quick. The other way to do this is you could do a quick game that lines them all up. Flora is Lava is perfect for this. Hopscotch, take all the sounds they've learned and just space them out. And they'll just jump on each one and say it quickly, put it in a random order. But any activity that you can do that gets through every sound as fast as possible with the kids saying them is a good activity for a review. I'm uh, just looking back through the chat to see if we've missed anything from earlier. I see a question about online tutoring and a reading expert similar to command for kids five and above to advance in reading. My honest perspective is I think it is most effective when you understand where your child is at you understand how reading works and you're the one who works with them. And I, I really don't care how much money someone has. There are celebrities and influencers and, and, and other folks with all the money in the world who I know for a fact are right now at home teaching their kid themselves, who could pay someone or could do tutoring, but they understand that when you have the relationship with your kid, the kid performs better. When you understand the activities they like, the kid performs better. Most importantly, when you have the consistent couple minutes a day, face-to-face -face, in person, it is gonna be online every day of the week. So if there are no other options, you know, this is what you wanna do, you've kind of made up your mind, you can go for it. I never recommend it personally because it's just not my belief. My career is about working directly with families and helping them work directly with their kids. So that is the method that I stand behind. From a little bit earlier, um, when is a good time for parents to do this teaching? Um, by the time school is done, my kids are tired and they will see this as just more school. Um, and just for reference, these uh, kids that Lauren is referring to uh, are seven and four. Yep. A wonderful question. And it's going to vary from family to family, the, the best advice I can give is you're looking for a time that works for both of you. For your kid, what you want is energy and focus. For many kids, this is during another activity. It might be during a meal when they're eating and they're happy. It might be during a bath where they're kind of relaxed and content in one place. It might be right before bed, before you do that book with them, or it might be when they first wake up in the morning and they've got energy. But it doesn't have to be, we just did school, now it's four o'clock, and now we've got to do this. It can be, we did school, it's four o'clock, now we relax, we do X, Y, Z, we have, we have dinner as a family, but between dinner and bath, we do five minutes of games, or right before the book, we do five minutes of games. It's got to work for the kid, and then it's got to work for you. It's got to be a time when you've got energy and where you're patient, because we all have points in the day where we're just not our best selves. And if we bring that energy in, it's not going to be as enjoyable for the kid. So I've done this with my son when I taught him. We started early morning, like first thing in the morning, like six, because I was up for work and he was super focused. Got out of bed at six. It was great. Eventually, my schedule changed and I had to do it later in the evening, like 6, 7 p.m. And that's when we could do it. That's when we did it. But I would, I would remember... We're not looking for a 30 minute block here. With the four year old and a seven year old, you're looking for five minutes with each. Maybe three minutes with the four year old, seven minutes with the seven year old, but just a little bit of time where they're focused and they're happy and 
where you're calm, you're confident, you're feeling patient. I think that I have gotten to all of the questions. Uh, if I've missed anyone, uh, you please feel free to raise your hand or pop it back in the chat or the Q and A. Um, we will keep an eye on it now. Um, just going back through. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've. What's that? I said the questions were were excellent, y'all. I appreciate it. And someone asked about the, uh, uh, let's see, the, the recording. And we will uh, definitely be sending that out uh, after the session, along with uh, the links that Spencer mentioned earlier. Oh, here we go from... Uh, Thank you, Jill. Great comment. Thank you, Jill. Wonderful. Lots of thank yous, Spencer. Uh, I've also gotten a lot of uh, texts from my colleagues uh, uh, who have been really excited about this session as well. Um, we have a uh, an, uh, Philly ABCs initiative uh, up in North Philly uh, where we've got uh, posters of letters uh, uh, placed on uh, a few different rec centers and playgrounds. And uh, uh, there's just a lot of excitement, both uh, about what you've shared with us today and kind of how it dovetails really nicely with uh, uh, other projects that we've got going on. So um, loving all of the thank yous in the chat. Um, looks like we are uh, leveling out with the questions. So um, if anyone has any, any last minute questions, feel free to add them. Uh, Spencer, as he mentioned earlier, is, is uh, eager to answer as many as, as, uh, as you all have. Um, but it looks like we are probably done with questions. <laughs> so Spencer, yeah. I'll, I'll turn it over to you just if you want to say any last words uh, as we close out here. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm just reading all the, the thank yous. I really appreciate that, y'all. And, you know, something that gives me energy is seeing parents doing the work, educators doing the work. It's it's not always the most popular point of view to say like, hey, here's something else that you can be doing, or here's something that's going to benefit your kid. But, you know, parents who who show up, who do the work, who invest to do better for their kids, like that gives me life. It gives me energy. It makes me so glad that I do this work. So, um, deeply appreciate it, Alex. Appreciate y'all's questions. Y'all can shoot me an email if you need. Um, happy to answer anything else. Um, but otherwise, y'all, like, whether you're a teacher, parent, educator, you can do this. Your kids can do this. It's not as hard and as scary as you think. And there's lots of people, hundreds of thousands of people uh, who are doing this work alongside you as well.